Oh my gosh, Mindy, we love you here. We love, thank you for representing with everything you do. <laughs> we love you, love you, Mindy. Hang on, isn't this supposed to be an interview? It feels like I'm sneaking in on someone's GalaxyCon conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to another video on the JBN Millie channel. I am JB and today I'm going to be breaking down a few interviews that I found of Mindy Kaling speaking about the new Velma show. So a bit of context about us and why we're making this video. Now when the whole news about Velma broke and especially when we got that first teaser image, we got into a dialogue with a few content creators in the Scooby-Doo fandom and it resulted in Mindy Kaling replying to us with this message saying, and her past isn't troubled it's spooky we are so psyched about her and can't wait to talk to real deal scooby fans like you closer to release is it more adult but real to authentic high school life yes that's why it's fun but also why it's worth doing we got you and since then we have heard absolutely nothing from mindy kaling she hasn't spoken to us or anyone that we know in the scooby fandom so it seems like this is kind of disingenuous and i am actually quite disappointed at mindy kaling for not at least following following up with one of us in regard to this. However, that doesn't mean that we can't chime in and talk about Mindy Kaling and some of the things that she said in other interviews, some of the things that we would have asked and how we would have handled certain situations differently and kind of pick apart what she said in hindsight and see if Mindy Kaling is being genuine in the build up to the show and I guess while the show is airing since we're about ready to wrap up the series next week in fact or later this week really. But in terms of what we do if this is your first video from us please consider subscribing because we have done and this is actually believe it or not an old visual over 70 interviews with people who have worked on the scooby-doo franchise all the way from scooby-doo where are you to most recently trick-or-treat scooby-doo and a lot more in the works we're only two weeks out from our 75th interview special and it is a huge one so you do not want to miss that so again please subscribe and i'll leave the playlist for all of our interviews so far in the description down below. Without further ado, let's get into some of these Mindy Kaling interviews. Hi Charlie. Now I do just want to briefly touch upon the name of this channel and that's the Nerds of Colour. It's something that resonates with me as a person of colour and I suppose I'm more or less in that nerd fandom right now and obviously I'm not going to pick apart the creator in terms of their naming. I've been a fan of stuff like that ever since I was a kid watching YouTube, for instance watching Black Nerd reviews and everything like that. So I'm a big fan of the whole ethos behind the channel, however from the point of view of Mindy Kaling it's almost like she's chosen a channel or she's chosen a page that aligns more with her point of view than not like it's not that she's gone on a neutral channel it's like she is one of the main figureheads for women of color for people of color within the entertainment industry and so to then select a channel that seems to promote that quite a lot it's like yeah a hundred percent she's chosen one of the safest options for her from the point of view of one having her get praised maybe banking on the interview we're getting overwhelmed or starstruck in the moment and also i guess lack of criticism i know no person signs on to an interview saying oh i'm gonna clear the air because i know i'm a bad person or i'm gonna do this to try and get challenged of course not you know it'd be naive of me to think that mindy kaling genuinely believes that she's got anything to prove here but i do think it's quite telling that she has actively selected channels and people that are less likely to challenge her compared to say us or any of the other shows out there <laughs> Nerds of Color, and this show is just so much fun. I'm so excited to speak with you guys about it. <laughs> Great, thank, thank you. That's so nice, thank you. And I really identify with your, um, with the name of your, like- Oh my gosh, Mindy, we love you here. <laughs> we love, thank, thank you. you for representing with everything you do. Nerd of you Color is, is really, I cannot think of a more apt name. Charlie, oh, not so much, but- <laughs> yeah, <I'm> so <laughs> we love you, love you, Mindy. <laughs> Okay, okay. I do know that I goofed on this in the intro. That's not actually what I fully think about it. I mean, I do get that vibe, but I want to say that that little clip in general is not a problem at all if either one, the interview's as long as it needs to be to get your information out, 
or two, it's long enough to justify some free time. This type of stuff I do on a regular basis, but the difference is that this is before we say, hello everyone, welcome back to another interview and all that stuff. So it's all the stuff that happens when our guest enters the Zoom call beforehand. Not really something that we include, especially not in the instance where I do sympathize with this interview in particular, because it does seem that Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy do only have about four minutes for like this promotional circuit but in that case I think it's wise to adapt and cut out all of that stuff until maybe afterwards and then you can express your gratitude but for the moment I think it's going to be good to get straight into the questions without wasting too much time because quite frankly Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy haven't given this interviewer a great deal of time. And again, this goes into my point. It's not really against the interviewer as such. I do think a part of Mindy Kaling was banking on this interviewer getting flushed and getting a bit starstruck. And I don't know if that happened. I haven't looked into the interviewer and seen who she's interviewed or I guess what she's used to dealing with. I'm not really sure. This could be her 200th interview and she's got way more experience than me. Or it could be her first. I really don't know. So maybe we'll look into that. But for the moment, I'm saying let's not waste time on things that aren't questions. Um, Charlie's like, I identify as, like, handsome. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I just, I stop at nerd. Like, that was where it's like... <laughs> Listen, we, we accept all the nerds here. Going off those first two episodes, so you could talk spoilers for those, we have obviously the two big mysteries, you know, the murders and then Velma's mom who's missing. Can you tell me how you both sort of came up with those as the core mysteries for this season and then anything fans should sort of pay attention to in order to solve them? Because I always like to try to solve them on my own, even though I don't always get them. <laughs> I do like this interviewer here. I think the way that she builds rapport as well as asking the question is absolutely what to do in this type of short interview. And for all, I wish that they'd given her a bit longer. I am curious to see where this goes initially because obviously it's not the type of question that I'd be asking to supplement that in terms of why th certain things were changed. And I guess the context that people in the Scooby-Doo community want to know. But in terms of an entertainment interview, this is a pretty pretty solid leading question. Sophia, it's so great that you mentioned that because, you know, Charlie created the show and what I'm so impressed with his storytelling and with our writers and what they've done is like, there is like these over, like, like the X-Files, like, which is, I, which is something I love. There'd be like an arc for a season, but then each episode would be sort of thrilling individually. And to be able to do both of those things, like I come from like high school comedy and female-centered comedies. I was so impressed that Charlie was able to do this. It's like, we knew we wanted it to be very funny, but was but what I was so impressed by what Charlie did is he made it scary and thrilling. And so that was important to me, but you know, like it was also important to Charlie and he literally did it. So I've, I've been so happy with that. So this is a very interesting response from Kaling here. And I think you can take it one of two ways. Either one, she is being quite humble and she's a good person. She acknowledges that she is the star. She is the name. You know, a lot of people are going to tune into the Velma show because they're fans of the Mindy Project or fans of The Office. And I think it's only natural that she would feel the need to highlight the creative. It's stuff that people do all the time, be it in an Oscar acceptance speech or I suppose just a lead actor either raising up their co-stars or raising up the writers i think it's perfectly fine but i think she does it so often that you could if you wanted to and i'm not saying that this is fact but you could if you wanted to interpret it that kaling maybe has doubts about the show doing well maybe isn't really on board with it at this point anyway and so she's like to anyone watching this it was mostly charlie charlie they did it thank you charlie for doing this yep yeah, oh he was responsible responsible for that you kind of know what i mean so for one you can interpret it that yeah mindy kaling's humble she's a good person or mindy kaling has just been caught crayoning the walls and she went but my brother did it thank you yeah it was fun i mean it was great it was really been a dream from the moment mindy approached me and now what maybe even four years ago was the first time we talked about this you know um, we were both at warner brothers and mindy was thinking about she said hey maybe an origin story of delma kind of like Riverdale and maybe there's a serial killer. And then, you know, and then I, I feel like even then when we were just kind of doing like that first initial pitch to Warner Brothers animation, you maybe even even threw out like, oh, and maybe her mom's missing and something. And then it just kind of took those and those elements are all so juicy. What's great 
is there's so much inherent conflict and which is also great for comedy, not just drama. It, it really um, was very helpful uh, in terms of crafting both the mystery and the uh, comedy to have the stakes so high for Velma. You know, I really love that even though it's a comedy, even though it's dark and all that stuff, you have these little details about Velma, such as she's having these hallucinations, which is obviously a hint towards mental health. And then you also had some body image comments in there, which I just thought was so interesting. Can you talk about throwing those in there and really making her a real character? Okay, so again, we've got a pretty solid question from the interviewer. And it's interesting because she does very much imply about the kind of comments made towards Velma, which aren't very flattering at all about body image. It's kind of the opposite of body positivity. And I do believe that the interviewer is asking that in a very polite way. So it's going to be really interesting to see how Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy actually respond to this point, because I think it's definitely one of the questions on our list. Like, what was the reason for continuously dunking on Velma's appearance you know of course they maybe think it's funny and that could be the response we're getting but I'm very curious to hear what they have to say yeah I mean one of the greatest things about Velma is that she doesn't have this sort of like traditional cartoon look even though she's from this period of time when all like the female animated characters like looked a certain way and it was really ahead of its time. She was so ahead of its time. And so honestly, Charlie took so much care in doing the the way her physicality was really important because we wanted to honor that, you know, yes. that she's the brains behind this group. She's so cute um, and has a very unique look. And it's like now there's so much talk about body positivity and, and all that. We just wanted to make sure to honor what you really look like. And I think the animators did such a good job with that. See, I am tempted to half agree with Mindy Kaling here, because if you look at the past of Hanna-Barbera characters from, say, Daphne to Jeannie to Penelope Pitstop, and even other characters such as Wilma Flintstone, Betty Rubble, they all do kind of fit that general same body image, that body shape. And so I can kind of see what Mindy Kaling is saying to this end. But then if you do look at the character of Velma from that original series, she isn't not that body type. She she just looks a bit more broad shouldered or I suppose a little bit stocky because of that heavy turtleneck sweater she's got on. I've no doubt that she is obviously maybe a bit stockier than say a Penelope pit stopper or a Daphne but I don't think Mindy Kaling really gets the point of that in this interview but I think regardless I can see what Mindy Kaling is saying but to that end, you would understand it more if the show itself actually promoted body positivity in regards to Velma. Like, there could be a commentary that maybe all the other characters are that traditional Hanna-Barbera style and Velma sticks out and she's kind of fighting against that. She's aspiring to be confident within herself. But in the actual show itself, we never see that. It's just Fred's dad calling her a lump. She's a beanbag. Like, there's just a load of stuff that isn't really that positive. Now... Obviously, we haven't seen the last two episodes. It could be that she becomes some type of bossy positivity plus size model and she inspires people, but I kind of doubt that very much. It's really incredible to see. And thank you both so much for your time. It was really a pleasure. I love the show. Can't wait for everyone else to see it. And thank you guys so much. Thank you for saying thank that. You. Nice. Thank you. So much. Thank you for saying thank that. You. Nice. Thank you. Now, one of my pet peeves is people in the premieres of videos commenting on how short an interview is, because in my opinion, with our experience, we make our interviews as long as they need to be. But in this case, what? Was that it? Like, I understand it's not on the interviewer's fault. Like, it is completely on Mindy Kaling, Charlie Grandy. Now, obviously, they're big executives. Uh, Mindy Kaling's quite a big star. They're going to have busy schedules. We understand that. But I'm just going to play back a little piece after this because it seems to me that Mindy Kaling is actually kind of rude here. She's got a massive smile on her face. And then when it seems like the time's over and things are wrapping up, that completely changes and she completely lunges one of her hands to what appears to be her monitor or whatever's directly in front of her. Now, from my point of view, that would only be for one of two reasons. Either one, you wanted to turn the volume up or down, adjust your brightness, or leave the Zoom call. And so, because the interview is over... They're going to be off the record. They're not going to be recording unless they're recording on their side... 
but I don't really see how that would be possible to supply the Nerd of Colour with that material after the fact. So I'm kind of thinking that Mindy Kaling just couldn't wait to get out of this. She just completely left and was in a really big rush afterwards. So you see the smile drop and she lunges to that laptop. I'm going to play it now, but let me see what you think. And then we're going to get straight into the next interview. Thank you for saying Thank that. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. I mean, do I need to say any more about the second channel, the people of colour culture? Obviously, like I said before, I completely like that ethos, but Mindy Kaling has so clearly cherry-picked the interviewers that she thinks will pose the least of a threat to her or that will praise no matter what she does. And I really don't understand that mentality. Like, I get purposely not wanting to be challenged. No one wants to be challenged like that. So if you can avoid it, it's only natural to do so. But at least make it make sense, you know. She said to us, I'm looking forward to talking to real deal Scooby fans like you closer to release. But I think what she actually meant was, I'm looking forward to talking to my fans before release. So I don't know if she just did this as an ego boost to gas herself up, but yeah. I'm really not impressed with Mindy Kaling's selection at all. I think the first interviewer was good, this one very well could be, but I don't think Mindy Kaling has actually looked into these channels to assess their quality or not. I do think she just heard the names on things. Oh, they're going to be my fans, so I'm going to go there. And again, I get that, but it's so safe. Hi, this is Ron from PLCCulture.com. Mindy, Charlie, how are you? Hey, good. how are you doing? So excited to chat with you. This show is so weird and so bold, and I love it so much. Um, but first, a, a question for you both on a personal level, and Mindy, I'll start with you. Who in your life would you call if you actually had to solve a real-life murder mystery? So I did criticise the first interviewer for wasting time at the start, but then I kind of feel like she recovered it nicely by bridging that off into a question that had the double whammy of building rapport and also asking a question about the show. I think what this interviewer has tried to be quirky, maybe it's a usual standard of their show to ask a question, a bit out there but on theme, but in this one, it's about five minutes long and we just don't have time to play these stupid games before such an interview. Like, there's two guests there. Maybe, 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 maybe. If it was one guest, maybe, maybe. Like, that's all I can say. Maybe that would be excusable. But there are two guests. You've got five minutes. We don't have time to waste on this, especially because it has nothing to do with the overall show. This is just fluff. Oh my gosh, what a great question. If I had to solve a real life murder mystery, I gotta tell you the person I would call because of their access and they're just so smart and just doors open for them is probably Reese Witherspoon. Like if there was a real life murder and I needed to solve it, I mean, maybe this is based on just watching her in Big Little Lies, like to be honest, but <laughs> Reese is getting to the bottom of this. Mm. The, oh, the head of the head of Hello Sunshine is finding out who killed this person. That is an awesome answer. I was fishing for BJ Novak, but I'll, I'll take Reese with a spoon. Oh, he couldn't find a murderer. He'd be terrible. He'd be <laughs> Charlie, what about you? Who would you call in your life to be your partner to solve the crime? Oh, boy. You know, honestly, my wife was a news producer and uh, is so good at researching and stalking people online. She can really, any answer, pop, anytime our kids express interest in any other person, like be it a friend or romantically, my wife will within five minutes be able to tell you exactly who their parents are, where they live, have they appeared in the news in any way. Like it's she is on the ball when it comes to researching and, and tracking down clues that other people can't find online. So my wife. I love it. Uh, notably, neither of the people you named are in the show, but, <laughs> but going into this great show. A part of me does respect this interviewer to an extent because for all they did ask a bit of a stinky question to begin with, I don't feel like Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy's answers were really that good and I think the interviewer as much as expresses that in the most polite way possible. They've both just gone onto this five minute interview to promote their brand new show and when they are faced with maybe a curveball question, maybe it was approved beforehand, I don't know, not one of them can come up with an answer 
and so that relates to the show and it's like I understand having your personality come across but from both the point of view of Grandy and Gailing it's a bit like why would you not at least use your own foresight as a bit of a hook to say okay bad question let's adapt to it and speak about the show it doesn't really seem like anyone in the zoom call exactly knows what to do right now but i am i do have faith in this interview i do think that they gave the best response that they could to the situation but overall not a great start um, sam never no <laughs> so, mindy uh I love how diverse this show is. You Not only is Velma South Asian, of course, um, but you reimagined several members of Mystery Inc. to be diverse. What went into that decision, and did you have any trepidation on how it would be received? I mean, no, first of all, so much of the credit is Charlie. Like, Charlie was the person who who's literally, like, he is such a fan of, like, Russell Peters, Ken Leung, you know, Yvonne Orji, like all these amazing people are on the show, obviously Sam and Constance, you know, but he was such a fan and was like, should we ask them? And they said, yeah. So Charlie is such a huge part of it. But um, for me, it just was like, I, it just felt like an animation is unlike these other shows that we work on. It's just, we just have to do the voices. So it felt like what a missed opportunity to not fill the cast of people of color. Also, Charlie and I have worked on so many shows with such different, like, Sex as of college girls, never have I ever. It's like we have now worked with so we have such a great roster of actors that we've worked with. Um, so it felt like this was just a great opportunity to make it look a little less traditional. So that was a really interesting question. Perhaps the best one out of both interviews that we've watched so far. And there's a lot to unpack from what Mindy Kaley has to say about this. So once more, it sounds very much like she's passing the buck on to Charlie Grandy. And that's kind of an issue from my point of view. Because it was about the race swap, the race changes. And I kind of feel like, say in an alternate reality, I know I hate it when people say, oh, if it was the other way around, it'd be this, that. And now I kind of feel like whenever there's a man writing from a woman's perspective, so say if the director of Wonder Woman or Miss Marvel was a guy, I think some people would find some issue with it. Like, yeah, they're showing the facade of, you know, change and progress, but behind the scenes, how much of that is in practice? And it's kind of like, I think the fact that Mindy Kaling herself, the spokesperson for the show, wasn't the one to decide the race swaps and everything. Now, I have no doubt that she herself would still want to imposit herself into Velma. So I do think Velma would have always been the Velma we see, looks-wise at least, on the show. But it sounds like Charlie Grandy was the one that decided to go with Constance Wu, Daphne, um, Sam Richardson as novel and make them look a little bit more like them in the show. So I kind of feel like if they're just doing it for the sake of it, just to be non-traditional, then that's just an issue. And it is a shame because I do feel like there's a lot of important stories to tell from the point of view of people of colour. But quite clearly, it was just Charlie Grandy's idea of getting back at the traditional thing. So I don't really like that at all. And from the top of my head, I don't really understand why changing what the characters look like necessitates the introduction of celebrity voice actors, because I think we really would have been more connected to the characters if they were more experienced with voiceover roles, or I guess a bit more endearing to us as fans. So for instance, Phil Lamar, I think, could have been a pretty good novel. Myrna Velasco, who recently played Coco Diablo, could have been a really good Daphne or Velma. So I really don't understand what the whole point is around this. Like, yeah, you know a lot of diverse people, but it doesn't mean you need to give them a job on your show, which is very dependent on doing well in order to pave the way for hopefully more stories from the point of view of people of colour. So I do think what they've done is overall relatively damaging to the people of colour community. And I think it looks beautiful. It's, it's so awesome. And Charlie, you and Mindy have worked together and everything you touch is gold. But this is a little bit different. Did you feel any anxiety about maybe a little bit of a risk dealing with reimagining such an iconic franchise? Absolutely. I mean, it was nice that Warner Brothers, from the moment we mentioned it to them, Warner Brothers Animation was on board and really for whatever we wanted to do. Um, so that got scary because I was like, well, I can't blame them for anything. <laughs> you know, if people don't, like this is exactly how we wanted to do it. Um, so uh, but yeah, it, it can be, you know, you want 
we're fans of the show. This really grew out of a love of Scooby-Doo and you want it to have that aspect of it that is a love letter to the fans that respects the original and all the continuing versions. I just watched Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo and it's fantastic. And I love that both these shoes, shows can exist in the Scooby-verse. Um, and so you want, you know, you want the Scooby fans to think that too. And so that, yes, that I've, I've had some, you know, some anxiety about. But you, you let that guide your writing. You know, really each time, each joke, each character, though we've updated them in some way, changed them in some ways, you really try to be respectful to the original and, and um, not veer too far from, from the original. So that was a very diplomatic answer from Charlie Grandy there. It almost seemed rehearsed, and I do think that it probably was in a way, because the amount of people that would have asked that very question is probably off the charts right now, so I don't blame him necessarily for having a pre-prepared answer, but it does seem a bit shocking that he even knew the name of Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo, because... This is me talking from the point of view that I've always wanted an adult take on Scooby-Doo. The 2002 movie, the original cut, yeah, give me that, put it in cinemas. I'm going to watch it at least 25 times a week. So I am definitely one that really wants to see that take, even if it is a bit of like satire. But this, to me, The Velma Show... It's mediocre, but it's it's entertaining me. I'm interested. But it's not an entertaining or even half entertaining Scooby show. It's a pretty mediocre and sometimes entertaining adult animation piece. Nothing more, nothing less. And as far as Scooby-Doo goes, it really isn't connected to Scooby whatsoever. So it isn't. Even if it was good, this show would not have scratched my itch for a proper adult Scooby-Doo show. So I do think he's probably being a bit disingenuous because he says he wants to be respectful to the original show, but nothing about the show has said that. Like, nothing is even about the show, really. I mean, if he was just honest, I think I'd get behind him a bit more because I don't think he has much love for Scooby. I don't think he wanted to do a Scooby show. And I have heard, and this is purely speculative, this is a rumour that this was meant to be completely unconnected, but for views and ratings, it was changed last minute. Don't quote me on that. It's just something I've heard over the grapevines. But I really don't think that there is much love for Scooby-Doo in this project. And I can forgive people for almost anything, but one thing is lying, and I do suspect that Charlie Grandy is lying. I definitely think this is a reimagining done right. What's the one thing you want Scooby-Doo fans to know about the show? Honestly, I think that we really revere the characters in the original and we think, you know, they we really used a lot of their most like the pillars of their personalities and just tried to explore that in a super like respectful and affectionate way. Um, yeah, we just we have so much love and admiration for Scooby all of the Scooby-Doo fans, you know, because it's been, the show came out in like the late 60s, so. I don't understand this. Why is she lying? Why do you even need to lie? You're a executive, you're a famous actress. Why can you not just say, I wanted my own spin on this, but really it's completely unconnected from the characters and it was done with my storyline and my interpretation of the show in mind. It would be a lot more like genuine than to just go oh this was made with the fans in mind this was made with the characters in mind like i don't hate the show but it wasn't made with the characters in mind it a hundred percent wasn't and i don't understand why she's lying and she can lie all she wants but people are gonna know the content like if it was just an ideas pitch meeting then great lie off your face to get it green lit say oh this is gonna be like the new scooby-doo this is gonna be scooby-doo for the modern age this is gonna bring scooby-doo into the new era and we're gonna make loads of money it's gonna be great people are gonna love it fine but your show is coming out you're doing the promotional circuit for it now why are you lying? And also, I don't expect Mindy Kaling to be completely up in the know with Scooby-Doo, but she 100% had to look down to read a script to know when Scooby-Doo started. And if you're making a whole show on Scooby-Doo, I'm sorry, if you can't even remember the term late 60s, what are you even doing? Yeah, we just, we have so much love and admiration for Scooby 
all of the Scooby-Doo fans, you know, because it's been the show came out in like the late 60s. So it's just a testament to um, how popular these characters are. And so all of the Scooby-Doo fans, you know, because it's been the show came out in like the late 60s. So it's just a testament to um we we really just feel honored to be part of it and excited for the fans to watch and to see how much you know we really try to beautifully capture the spirit of the original i definitely think this was a home run congratulations to you both and can't wait for our future seasons thanks Thank you so much so there you have it that's two interviews kind of reacted to and broken down we've made our comments honestly i do really like the two interviews on both of those shows they were pretty good with what they did i kind of feel like the, the first interviewer asked some okay questions but overall was a better natural interviewer i think she was able to use bridges and came across a lot better than the second interviewer but i think the second interviewer had a lot more to do in terms of better questions up their arsenal and i do think overall i learned a lot more from that second interview than the first one but big love to both of them in all honesty like whoever if anyone ever like takes the courage to do a podcast interview huge respect in my books like any person even that we don't get along with we instantly respect us if they do podcast interviews because from first-hand knowledge they are really not easy things to do but i i do feel like we could have done so much better interviewing mindy kaling and charlie grandy like i think if they were to just give us 15 minutes they can cap it off. They can literally arrange for an agent to press the leave button at that 15 minute limit. But I think I could ask a lot more questions, get a lot more information out of it. And even if they wanted to approve questions beforehand, like I just feel like we could have done such a better job. But if you're watching this and you keep up with the channel, I think you guys kind of know that as well. So, I mean, that's the thing. I would like to interview Mindy Kaling. It's just, I know for a fact, there is no way, after having to look down at a script, to know that Scooby came out in the late 60s, and I do think she continued to look down at the script, because she'd planned in her mind, like, she was gonna say the exact year, she was gonna say some fun facts about the original show to make people go, oh, holy crap, she knows, she's like a proper fan, but then I just think she got flustered after missing where she'd written 1969, and then just went, oh, I can't be seen to be looking at the script too long, I'm just gonna like end it there so i don't think there's any way she gets in a zoom call with scooby fans because she just isn't one and that's a hundred percent fine i don't think you need to be a fan of something to be good at writing it or be involved in it for instance chris chibnall is my least favorite doctor who writer of all time yet he was watching the show growing up as a kid one of my favourite actors for Doctor Who of all time is Christopher Eccleston, and he admitted to never watching Doctor Who before he was on the show. So being a fan of something doesn't automatically make you good. So I don't think Mindy Kaling should be ashamed, in all honesty. If Charlie Grandy said he never watched Scooby, fine, because he was the writer at his production company, fine. But Mindy Kaling as just the figurehead for this, I don't think there's a great need for her to say, oh, I'm a Scooby fan, I know about Scooby because that isn't what she's there to do. So that's my take on it. Mindy Kaling, this is an open invitation to come on our show. You can set all the terms, you can set all the demands, but I am going to ask the questions that I'm going to ask. And I do think that people will feel like they've actually learned something after watching that. But I guarantee you now that that will never happen. But there you have it. What do you think about this? What do you think about these interviews? And again, like I said in the warning, do not spread any hatred to the hosts of the podcasts because it is a tough thing to do and at the end of the day they landed a pretty big interview and i do think that both of them did extremely well given the circumstances i'm definitely going to be subscribing to their channels i recommend that you do too so i'm going to leave their links in the description down below but I will say this, I'm going to be monitoring their comment section quite a lot, you know, going forward. So if there is any hatred from people that we know here, we are just going to remove the links. And honestly, we're just going to be disappointed because the point of this video was not to spread hatred, but it was just to extract information. So there you have it. If you want to have more content from us, then please like, comment and subscribe to JBN Miller.